IT Cloud Breakfast, which is on Wednesday the 18th of November, 7.30 to 8.45 in, uh, at the Ridges Latimer Hotel, 30 Latimer Square, Christchurch. Um, background to that though is that we've been talking about um, Microsoft Cloud and Google Cloud. Um, Catalyst are a primarily open source company. Sorry. Entirely. <laughs> Fanatically, you can say. Um, and um, the software vendor for Seismic, actually, the Seismic Digital Archive, they're implementing an OpenStack-based cloud um, based in New Zealand. So it provides a potential solution for people wanting open source products um, and also um, people who are interested in data sovereignty in a New Zealand context, which is a particular issue in New Zealand because all of our servers, as cloud servers, are offshore. Um, so my, I've just realised um, at the end of your talk, Paul, that I've mistitled my talk because the chapter, this chapter in my book is actually called Towards a Global Systems um, Analysis of the Humanities. So we have sort of gone backwards and Alan started talking about the, the theory and um, started moving into infrastructure. Um, I think Paul's brought us down to some concrete examples. Um, I'm going up to 40,000 feet and trying to ask some questions about what infrastructure is, sort of winding the conversation back to square one and asking what our current state is. Um, so in this talk, um, I'm, I'm just going to talk around, um, give you a bit of an overview of one of the chapters of my book that is very systems focused, it's the most systems focused chapter in the book. Um, I talk about ethics, I talk about theory and other chapters. So this is going to be a very sort of wires and boxes type talk, I'm conscious of um, of people not figuring that large in it, but I'll, I'll get to that as well. I'll start off by talking about the politics of cyber infrastructure or infrastructure, which I think is one of the most important critical frames um, to view the wires and boxes through. Um, then I'll outline um, the, the chapter towards the systems analysis and then talk through a diagram, the key diagram in the chapter, which is a um, an enterprise architecture model of the current state of global humanity cyber infrastructure. So it's rather capacious. Um, and it would be good to have that um, interrogated. So the politics of cyber infrastructure. A bit of a potted history here, I suppose. Um, my introduction to humanity cyber infrastructure really started with um, the, the publication of the American Council of Learned Societies report, Our Cultural Commonwealth, um, 2006. It charted um, massive opportunities that have been talked about before, but I think it crystallised in this report, for computationally intensive humanities research, um, mirroring activity that was had been happening in um, the STEM disciplines for some time, but um, driven off the back of large digitisation efforts that were producing very large corpuses of digitised material that seemed to offer um, potential for, for seriously computationally intensive research. Um, it, it instantiated a mode of infrastructure and, or humanities infrastructure, a way of thinking about humanities infrastructure that was modelled on the STEM um, style of infrastructure, the big dollar STEM model, we could call it. And I have no great problem with that either. I think that's, that was a good place to start. You may as well look for models that are already working um, and look for models that might provide the, the most amount of leverage for computers. Um, a few big projects were initiated around the world and didn't deliver what they hoped. Um, there's a famous article, I think, in ZNet magazine that says that 65% of IT projects fail, um, and by that they mean they fail to deliver something. They either go over budget or they feel, fail to deliver key functionality or there's some sort of disappointment. 
But in the humanities com community and in the research community, um, these failures, um, to whatever degree they were, failure to deliver, um, loomed quite large. Because these large STEM-based projects were getting millions of dollars um, at the expense of traditional researchers who just needed money to travel to a library. So there is some, there's, a, there's a political background there. Jeffrey Rockwell um, produced a, a good article in 2010 who uh, sums up the zeitgeist, I suppose, the reaction against big dollar STEM style infrastructure. And he asked, do we really need these expensive revolutionary new infrastructures? The, the impetus and the funding proposals to get these dollars out of the national governments involved always positioned, sensibly, it was a good idea to, positioned these infrastructures as potentially revolutionary. Patrick Svensson um, is a scholar who looked at things from a slightly different angle. Um, he asked, what about people, spaces, laboratories? The argument is that the humanities don't need wires and boxes. Um, we aren't mature enough, our data's too messy. We're never going to be able to get um, enough value out of computationally intensive research. It'd be better to put our money into people, spaces and laboratories. More recently, we've had feminist critiques from people like Miriam Posner, who asked, what about gender and race? We all know that Silicon Valley is dominated by white middle class men. Um, are the infrastructures that we're going to implement simply going to reproduce that? And it's easy to shrug your shoulders at that and say, well, they're just computers. But one of the great benefits of the humanities is that we interrogate our wires and boxes and we say, well, no, actually, there are, there are, there are ways to produce more inclusive and diverse data models. We need to look at our data models. We need to look at the products that we're using. We, look at, we need to look at how we, we can make them more um, gender and ethnic inclusive, ethnically inclusive. And I think um, Alan's mentioned Susan Starley as well. Um, historians of technologies and ethnographers of technology are starting to give us new ways of looking at infrastructure and um, not necessarily politicising it, but looking at it in anthropological terms, not looking at the digital as something alien, as something new, um, but as something that's embedded in normal human practice and sits within a long-term 10,000-year continuum of um, technological development. And she also points out that infrastructure isn't boring, that it is political. Well, one of the things that's happened with this backlash, there has been, there's been a backlash against infrastructure for all of these reasons in the humanities, I think for good reason. Um, one of the, one of the um, corollaries to that has been this feeling that infrastructure is boring, um, that it doesn't, it doesn't raise itself to um, the standard of the great things that are thought about in the humanities. It, it pales in comparison to Shakespeare and, 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 um, and what, what we love about the humanities. So ethnography provides us with a different way to look at infrastructure, make it more interesting. Um, Politicising it is one way. What she also makes me think, though, is that reminds me that she reminds me that water pipes, bridges, playgrounds. You know, we all accept that these are important, that these are political, and that these are worth fighting for. My argument is that humanists should take the same attitude to our infrastructure. That we need to politicise it. We need to ask um, what we're fighting for. But given that, even if we decide that the infrastructure is important, that we should care about the wires and boxes that are powering our libraries in the same way that we care about our playgrounds, what does it look like? We've had a lot of talk of infrastructure today and for the last 10 years, but I've never actually seen it defined. I think humanists, when, when, 
when STEM people talk about infrastructure, they tend to understand what it is. It's a telescope or it's a database. Um, in the humanities, we have to be a lot more hand wavy because things that it's never been defined. So my chapter asks, does anyone know what our current state infrastructure looks like or if there even is one? If we're having this big backlash against the infrastructure or we're putting millions of dollars into it, whatever our position is on it, you would think that we would um, have done some due diligence and understand what it looks like. Um, it's a sort of first step for any engineering process. Um, but then how would we go about working that out? Do we just take discrete examples and say, well, there's the seismic archive, that's one type of infrastructure. Um, there's, um, there's Google, that's another. Where does, it, where does it fit? In the engineering field, you do a systems analysis. And that systems analysis sounds like it's very, would be very wise and boxes related, and it is, they tend to be. Um, but people and politics also um, come into it. But I was trepidatious about systems analysis, and I think we need to be really careful about importing systems analysis into the humanities. Robert Lilliamfield wrote a really good article in Social Research. It's an iconic article in 1975 titled Systems Theory as an Ideology. Well, he pointed out, and it's fascinating to me as a historian of ideas, the impact of systems theory on contemporary thought. Um, we talk about economic systems, business systems, political systems um, natively today. But in the 19th century and before, we wouldn't have used that word. Systems theory is a peculiarly um, modern way of looking at the world and looking at people and networks and infrastructures. And one of the things about it is that it's highly embedded in um, discourses of um, bureaucratic discourses, neoliberalism, managerialism. We can ask why. It's because it's so efficient. It's an efficient mode of analysis. Once you label something a system, you can put it under the microscope, you can see where the inputs and outputs lie, and you can start pulling levers. You can start implementing policy levers and management levers and start manipulating that system in interesting ways. So systems analysis is highly political. Um, it adopts, when you make a systems analysis of a system, you capture it in time as accurately as possible. Um, and you normally do it with a purpose in mind. So it does need to be taken um, with care, used with care. There are other ways of looking at systems as well, though, that are more positive. So systems analysis in that instrumentalist mode is a dangerous thing. But systems are always also talked about by historians of technology in a completely opposite way and a much more positive way. Historians of technology talk about um, systems in opposition to technological determinism. So the unsophisticated way of looking at technological development is to say that history advances in a deterministic fashion. That it's not people that control technology, the, the world or society, it's technology. That um, fire gives us a particular society. Um, the, in pure Marxist terms, I suppose, um, the, the hand loom gives us a village society, the steam engine gives us industrial society. So when you're analysing a system in that sense, if you're a technological determinist, you're going to say that people have no control. We're, we're, we don't know it, but technology is in control. What Thomas Hughes said was, was that that's wrong. It's a, right, it's a category error, that if we want to look at the relationship of technology to society, we need to look at human technological systems. Um, the classic example that I give is a NASA control, system, NASA control room. You look at the NASA control room and say, well, what's driving that? What's determining that system? Um, it's not the computer. It's an incredibly complex system. It's computers, it's people, it's the weather. 
So that, that's the mode of systems analysis that I would like to bring to critical infrastructure um, analysis in, in the humanities. In addition to that, I think humanists can bring ethics. I think we need to look at the ethics of infrastructure. Once we've done our systems analysis, and part of the goal of doing a systems analysis is to be able to look at it um, and ask whether it mirrors our values, um, where we want to put our investment, whether we simply want to build out one part um, purely for functionality, or whether we want to say, no, we'd rather put our money here where there's ostensibly less cost benefit, but um, it will enhance our values and, our, and the, the ethical nature of the system better. Um, do we want to buy Microsoft? Do we want to use OpenStack? It allows for those sorts of poli policy decisions to be made. But until we understand what the system looks like, we don't have that level of control. So as well as the ethics of infrastructure, we, we can think about labour market ethics. And it always fascinates me that, for instance, historians now might be running tutorials using iPads built in Foxconn factories where factory people have commit su committed suicide, um, teaching their students about Dickensian factory labour conditions. Th that's well and good, that's fine. But I think that we need to interrogate that and be aware of the ironies that um, Silicon Valley and, um, and, and, and commercial IT is, is driving us towards. Personally, I'd still use the iPad, but I might sort of bring it, use it as a teaching moment. The problem is that humanists are utterly blind to that contradiction in the first place. Um, corporate values in the classroom, in a nutshell. So anyway, that, that's sort of the background lens that I'm trying to look at this through. What does a global humanity cyber infrastructure look like? And I, let's get reductive. If humanists really want to do a thoroughgoing systems analysis of our cyber infrastructure, I think we need to get right down to the plumbing. Um, so this is um, the classic layered view of um, the internet with um, the end-to-end -end argument is the way the data flows between these four layers. And the end-to-end -end argument, um, IT guys can slap me around later if I get it wrong. The end-to-end -end argument basically says that each of these layers should be discrete. You should only implement something at one of these layers if it can be completely and correctly implemented at that layer. Which is why um, at layer two, you've only got an IP address. Because if we put something else in that layer, then um, then the architecture, that screws up the architecture. So global humanity cyber infrastructure only actually sits at layer four in this internet network model. But the lower layers have, have a huge effect on the upper layers. Now who out there might be inclined to um, circumvent or degrade the end-to-end -end argument to some degree? I think it's been happening for a while. Um, you guys can probably tell me if I'm wrong. I think it's been under pressure for a long time. Um, but my understanding is that um, ISPs are quite happy to put monitoring into a particular layer there that can't be cor correctly implemented in a particular layer in order to throttle. So net neutrality um, Net neutrality and the freedom of the internet um, is all implicit in this layer, in this layered um, architecture. Equally, if we're going to go down to that level, we need to start thinking about network typologies. So most humanists, when they talk about network typologies free of the engineered nature of the internet, um, talk about the rhizome um, that Deleuze and Guattari um, raised and used in A Thousand Plateaus in 1988. Um, people have moved beyond that. But I'm interested in um, these different network typologies that are used 
um, in an engineering sense to describe the many different ways um, that data flows, not just through the internet and through networks, um, but through um, enterprise buses, through um, systems and circuits in, your, um, in the devices themselves. And this is, I think, part of the underpinning of my approach, is that I, my argument is that an analysis of humanity's cyber infrastructure should be anchored to some degree um, in the engineering principles of the infrastructure itself, um, which to um, engineering-minded people might not be so radical, but to humanists it is. Because we quite often just throw theory at things, and it doesn't really matter if it's aligned um, to the nature of the system. Um, the, the proof or the validity of that theory is um, almost purely rhetorical, or the power of that theory is rhetorical or, or argumentative. So anyway, what does it end up looking like? This diagram is really the core of the chapter. It's based on um, the open architecture groups, one of the open architecture groups models Model 42, I think. Um, the Open Architecture Group is an enterprise architecture forum um, that provides lots of different models that you can use to um, do systems analysis, enterprise architecture, and co. Um, so to me, this is global humanity cyber infrastructure. Now I guess if I'm going to walk through the salient points, most of what we talk about is in here. When we talk about humanity's cyber infrastructure or infrastructure, we only talk about um, systems that are in here, library, archives, institutional repositories, records management, um, and tools, um, infrastructure, like seismic, national biography, Australian national biography, um, transcribed Bentham and co. Um, but it's only a, one slice of what humanity cyber infrastructure actually is. So what I'm trying to do is, is, is explode, I guess, this notion that humanity cyber infrastructure um, should be modelled on STEM. What I, actually, what I argue is that humanity cyber infrastructure is much more capacious than the STEM model. The humanity cyber infrastructure extends out into the cultural tundra. Um, so as well as the university system, we also have significant assets in government. In the National Library here, we have Digital New Zealand. We've just seen the situation in Australia. Um, in America, they have American Memory. British have British Library. Um, we also have non-governmental organisations. So the Internet Archive, um, JSTOR, the Hathi Trust, they're all a core part of humanity's global infrastructure. And I think that's indisputable. They are. Any humanist who, you, know, you, you talk to will say that they use them on a daily basis. Um, go even further. Blogs. You can say this for size, um, science as well. Um, you have blogs, um, the equivalent of diaries, ephemera, out in the non-commercial web. Blogs, archives, content management systems, publishing. So what I've tried to do with this diagram is just give a few indicative examples of the type of infrastructure assets that sit within a particular sector um, and then provided examples of the, um, the type of systems that support that infrastructure. And I suppose that's the other, um, other way to read this, um, this diagram is that all of these all of these assets are connected through um, a metadata environment. So we've looked at Honey. I mean, we have these um, down the bottom here. We have Digital New Zealand, Honey, DPLA, Europeana. We do have some specific infrastructures um, that, that do highly aggre concentrated aggregations of cultural um, humanities data. But equally, if you're looking at it in the broader sense, we have the web and we have many different types of metadata schemas um, that 
that function of uh, sometimes function outside of these aggregation points. So the other thing about this that I found interesting, and maybe it's just the way I drew the diagram, <laughs> if, is that if you go to the right of the diagram, politically it tends to towards the right of centre, politically. So the further, the further to the left of this diagram you go, out into the open web, um, the further to the left, politically, the um, governance of the assets becomes. The further to the um, right, um, the further capitalist it gets, interestingly. Um, that makes a pretty broad assumption um, that open source um, and sort of hacker ideo ideologies, as you were, or practices are sort of, yeah, are leftist. Um, and that the more you get up to this area, the more commercial and capitalist it is. But that fits with the other tension in the model, which is that the further to the right you go, the further right politically it gets, but the more pressure there is to close access to the content. And the further to the left you go, the more pressure there is because of the ideological basis of it, to open up the content. Um, so up, up the top here, you have EBO, which is Early English Books Online, which has recently been in the news for <laughs> locking down content. Um, Cengage, ProQuest, social media companies as well. Um, and down the bottom, you just have the open web. Another interesting thing about it is that as you go up, they tend, to, they tend towards services. So as you go up the model, it tends towards um, Microsoft, um, Google Apps, Gmail, Facebook. These are services that you can use. They're not tools that you can hack. The further this way you get, the further non-commercial they become, um, the more tool-based um, and open to manipulation they become. Down the bottom here you have this tendency towards, at, at this end, in this quadrant I suppose you could say, open source database products, open source operating system, open programming languages. I need to delete that. I don't know what an open programming language is. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and up the top, um, more commercial. The main anomaly in this, and it says something, it doesn't say anything, this is the TOGAF model, it's, I just plugged this stuff in and this is what it looked like. Um, the one anomaly that's quite interesting um, is in here. We've got the situation where the large internet companies, Google and Facebook, are actually running on open source code. Um, so you've got this open source code, you know, right up at this closed end of the diagram. Um, that's an anomaly, but we understand why it's an anomaly. We understand the commercial drivers for Facebook and co to open source artificial intelligence engines and, and let us use them. Um, <clears throat> the last bit that I haven't, haven't mentioned is this um, preservation layer, um, UK data archive, New Zealand digital heritage archive and co. Um, so, this is one view. I argue in my chapter for a genre of systems analysis or critical infrastructure analysis. I think it's probably a better term. I, I personally think we need dozens and hundreds of these different types of views from different perspectives within the humanities community. That's what a critical view of systems analysis in the humanities gives to you. It makes you realise um, the subjectiveness of this. You know, I've said that I've, I've done my best to anchor it in engineering, so there's, it's got some sort of connection to the real. That's my thing, sort of post-phenomenology. I'm interested in the nature of digital objects, the nature of infrastructure in philosophical terms. So, um, of course, I'm going to bury down into engineering. Um, but I'm aware that that's a subjective position to take to systems analysis. Um, but I do think that for political purposes, systems analysis becomes quite powerful. If we can look at glo define a global humanities systems infrastructure in this way, then we can start talking to our enterprise architects and other people in government um, in our universities and saying, 
we would prefer that you invested at this end. You know, we're sitting here in the, in the university. It's interesting, isn't it, that the universities are quite high up, as you know, commercial entities, um, to, towards this era and uh, this area. Um, and it explains why a lot of um, university-based digital humanities projects, for instance, are under quite a lot of pressure to close down their content and monetize it. Um, and as with Seismic, we make a quite firm political decision to open our content. We want to put pressure on to, to, to move down this way. And, and I, I just think that a diagram like this allows us to have a more mature argument um, or discussion about, about the politics of cyber infrastructure. And I'll say one more thing, that I would hope that I, it's not, I'm be, I don't want to be pejorative towards this end either, because I think part of that mature discussion um, includes an awareness of the ecosystem, of the importance of all the different components within it. Um, and I, there is a space for Google Apps for Education and Microsoft 365. Um, but it needs to be balanced uh, across a, a fuller understanding of, of a global humanity cyber infrastructure and where we put our content. Um, and so finally, there's something missing in that diagram that I deal with elsewhere in the book, um, and, and it's people. So the big difficulty for me is, um, I think with this chapter, is going to be um, the fact that I ignore this problem and this is the problem that 99% of humanists care about. When they t think infrastructure, they think this. They don't want to look at systems diagrams. And it's difficult to, to communicate the value, the potential political value of, of systems analysis in that way. Thank you. That, that's a really good idea, and it reminds me that what I've just presented here could could appear really brittle to the IT people in the audience, <laughs> because it's it's just one. It's, it's not even one view. It's you know, IT professionals, if they were going to do this exercise, um, would would have whole libraries of diagrams. Um, you know, so I, I've, I've probably. Haven't, haven't even got 1% of what uh, an IT professional would do to do this sort of task. It's very, and in, in that sense, I'm conscious that it's, it's quite conceptual. But I, do, I, I think that's a really good idea. I think um, that, that we need different views. Solution architects talk about views. Um, and I think we need lots of different views of this. Um, and that perhaps the danger of my chapter is that people, that it all sort of become hypostasized and people will look at, point at this diagram and say, this is humanity cyber infrastructure. And it's not. It's just one of a thousand possible different views of it, um, which makes it even more important potentially to, to keep going and, and, and get more people involved.